morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the eighth meeting of the Social Security Committee 2017. Uh, if everyone could turn off their mobile phones as usual. Um, I've received apologies from Sandra White and Mark Griffin. Um, first item on the agenda is to ask the committee if we can agree to take um, uh, several items in private. Um, just for the record, item four is to consider response to the budget process. Item five to consider a report to the annual report. And item six to consider nominations for expert support for our work. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. <coughs> so moving on to the main item for business, that's the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. Um, today is our second of the committee's formal evidence sessions on the bill, and we have two panels of witnesses. So first of all, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for their attendance and for their written submissions, which have been very helpful. Uh, I'd like to formally welcome the panel. So we have Peter Allen, Community Planning Manager for Dundee City Council, Professor Andrew Russell, Med Medical Director and Deputy Chief Executive of NHS Teesside. We also have Robert McGregor, who's the Policy Manager for Fife Council, and Dr Margaret Hanna, Director of Public Health, NHS Fife. So, a powerful panel. Thank you all for coming along. Um, I'd like to begin by asking the panel um, why you think child poverty legislation is needed or perhaps you don't think it's needed. So, any one of you, if you'd like to kick off. <laughs> Well, I think it's a, it is welcome, um, partly because um, it, it focuses minds. Um, it focuses minds on a, 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 a very difficult issue, uh, but we know it has ramifications throughout society. Um, and um, with the dropping of that target from the UK government's um, agenda, it feels appropriate that we should do something in Scotland that, that, that addresses this, because we as a nation want to do something. We feel very committed towards addressing child poverty in the round. So I am, in, I am supportive of the, of the idea. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? If, if I was to come in, um, before I took on my current role, I was a GP for nearly 20 years in the, some of the poorest parts of Dundee, so I understand the importance and significance and recognise that in the absence of putting the type of structure that you're describing with this bill around it, we've had years of aspiration but limited evidence of delivery. So the opportunity to see uh, the, the, the targets and the way you describe, I think, gets us into a different territory around delivery. And certainly, I'm, from a personal perspective, very supportive of that convener. Thank you. Peter Robert, want to add yeah. anything to that? Could I, um, I think that if, if we're genuinely committed to reducing the inequalities in the country, then um, child poverty is a fundamental question of uh, social justice, um, especially since uh, some people may misguidedly believe that people choose poverty or that poverty is their fault, but no one ever questions that children who are born into poverty made a choice to, to, to live in poverty. So I think it gives us a, um, a, a platform that everyone will support. I think the other reason is that it gives us a chance to have a sustainable commitment because often policy priorities come and go, but I don't think child poverty is one that anyone would ever be willing to accept. And uh, I think this bill helps us to, to make a, a positive and sustainable commitment. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I think finally, uh, it's, it's an area that most local authorities and the partners have, have been working on for a number of years, but perhaps not all to the same extent. And I think anything that raises a profile of, of child poverty as, as, a, as a must do rather than uh, a good to do is, is a good thing. Thank you. That's very helpful in setting the scene. So I'm going to call on members to ask some questions. Um, if you feel it's, you don't all have to answer every question, but just indicate to me if you, if you do to make sure it's all all covered. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by calling Ruth Maguire, the convener. Good morning, panel. Um, thanks for being here and thanks for your for your written evidence. Um, it was particularly helpful to see sort of spelt out a number of the things that your um, partnerships are doing to tackle poverty um, and I suppose I want to explore a little bit how the bill will help with that and won't just add 
extra reporting or extra work that's not actually going to deliver results for for the people that we're trying to help. I don't know if, if there's going to be specific questions about the, the, the shape of the reports and the contents or the value of them, but uh, would that be a reasonable place to, to start? Yeah, that'd be helpful. I, I think that the, um, the, the reports are interesting um, in the sense that everybody's going to have a story to tell about what they're doing about child poverty. And um, you would really hope that in developing local outcome improvement plans, all of the country would be explicitly making a commitment to that and saying what they're going to do. Um, but I'm not absolutely confident that that would, that would be the case. So when a luck the bill would, would reinforce the need for that. In terms of reporting, though, I think that, that there's, there's an, a few interesting questions to ask, which is about it's this kind of so what thing. Um, so what, there's, a, there's a, an annual report on child poverty from the Scottish Government or from Dundee City Council or its local partners. Um, do, we know, do we know what um, what good enough looks like in terms of a, a, a local delivery on child poverty? Who's going who's to tell us what the um, report should include? Who's going to tell us if that's good enough? Um, we could have a report where all the long-term targets are going down, but we've done incredible things, and vice versa. We could have targets going, going up, and we've done nothing very much about it. I think the, the issue is so complex, and the, 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 the factors that contribute to change are so complex, that properly reporting on reasonable progress will be really, uh, really hard. But I think it's absolutely crucial that people are held, that organisations are held to account to demonstrate the specific action that they are taking to reduce child poverty. So I think there probably needs to be a, more of a discussion about what targets would look like, how you would frame local uh, short-term action that would be positive. And if, you know, if we wanted, we could talk about, a bit more about that later. Thank you. Anyone else want to add? Yep. Targets are always a challenge, certainly from a health perspective, because there is always a fine line between something that is um, a reasonable aspiration and something that's unachievable. Um, and um, we need to ensure that we frame targets within the context of the things that people should be doing anyway, and are measures of things that our people are and systems are, are, are doing anyway. Um, the opportunity to produce integrated children's service plans, which is emerging across Scotland, you could see some of the outcome measures that may be described with it within this bill as being a, a legitimate outcome and, and, and a quite useful measures measure within the context of improvement to, to, to fall out of those integrated children's service plans. So really just to pick up on Peter's point, it's important we don't get into a model that reports solely for the purpose of reporting. Yep. To, to pick up on that, uh, I, th I think one of the risks around uh, what I see written in the bill is that um, it appears as if we are being asked to simply report activity. And if, if that's the case, that there is a risk that uh, we, we just continue doing what we're doing and have always done around all of this. Uh, it, 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 it isn't absolutely clear to me what we're actually being asked to do over and above what we currently do and whether the bill will, will, in, the, in the Act will, will eventually uh, provide a great deal of scrutiny and, and support and, and sharing and learning, etc. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that um, in order to make sense of the actions that we are all taking locally, everything's joined up. And I mean, our work with with council isn't just between the NHS and the council. It's a wider partnership effort to address poverty in the round. Of course, there are specifics around children and families. Um, but if we are only kind of called to account around one specific target, there is a risk that we are not uh, addressing these issues in, in the most effective way that we could be. Um, Part of what we, we ch the challenge here is 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 conceptual that um, a target um, can be something that you aim for, uh, and you know, you know the arrow to the to the bullseye, um, but there can also be an attractor. It can be an attractor to mobilise effort towards a goal, and I think that's what this target is about because we 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 all want to mobilise 
societal efforts to address poverty um, for children and families. Uh, and if we see it in that, in that light, then I think it's, it's going to have more meaning for us at the local level. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I suppose I'd, I'd be interested to hear how um, you're measuring outcomes at the moment on the work that you're doing um, around poverty, specifically around um, children and families, if that's possible. You've detailed in your submissions quite a lot of work that's ongoing, so it'd be good to hear. I think we always find... Sorry. I was just going to comment on some of the health stats, of course. I mean, you know, stillbirth, low birth weight, um, infant mortality, um, maternal mortality, all of those things have a very strong social gradient. Uh, and, um, and it is something that we're very much keeping a very close eye on and looking to see what mitigating factors we could introduce. Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say that the, when we're talking, if, if, you, if you view the outcomes in terms of the long term income uh, and poverty targets, then we have very little to show what marginal incremental change we're achieving on, on each year. I think what, what's, what's more important is for us to have some kind of logic modelling approach where we can work back from the long-term outcomes and say reasonably what are the actions that we think we can take now that would have the biggest impact over the longer term and to set really stretching targets around those. So is it you know, the number of kids who are getting their uniform grant, the, the, the level of uh, income maximisation? Is it the number of people who are getting supported to do pres uh, social prescribing? You know, a, a, a range of practical measures and put all our efforts into doing as much of that as, as possible on the basis that, that you and everyone else would, would have faith that these were the right things to achieve the long-term support. So we probably, the way we're looking at it in Dundee is to, to focus less on the, the long-term outcome that's going to be really hard to change and say, well, what could we be doing this year and next year? Demonstrate a logical connection between those and then put all our efforts into making the, the short-term stuff happen and doing it really well. One of the, um, the interesting things for me is that both Dundee and Fife have recently had fairness commissions. And one of the, the, the challenges that came from the work of those fairness commissions was around um, outcomes and measures and targets. So what we are looking to do is actually refresh our approaches and, and how we're looking to measure success through the, the challenges that came through those, those commissions, certainly from a Fife perspective. So what we'll see, I think, is uh, the, the Commission's work heavily reflected in local, local outcome improvement plans going forwards. What we'll also have to do, of course, is anything that comes through in, in terms of legislation uh, around child poverty, is look to see how that is reflected within LOIPS as well. Okay. Thank you. Adam Plumkin. Uh, thank you, Kavina, and good morning, everyone. Um, our, our job as a committee uh, here is to uh, focus our scrutiny on this bill as introduced into the Parliament and to think about ways in which uh, it might be improved. Um, and, and I want to ask a, a range of questions uh, you know, with that, with that um, task in, in mind. Now, the, um, the centrepiece to my uh, mind of, uh, of this bill are the four um, income-related targets. Um, and one of the things that is notable about those targets is exactly that they are all income related. And so my first question is whether the members of the panel think that it is um, sufficient. I think we've probably agreed that it's necessary, but the question is whether it's sufficient um, to measure uh, child poverty um, by reference to um, income alone. answer to that is that um, in Dundee when, when we discuss this we always say it's not all about money but it's definitely about money and so whatever else poverty is about and one of the phrases that drives me crazy is that um, uh, oh, worse, than, worse than income poverty is poverty of aspiration I think no no poverty of no money and sending your parents to bed cold when they, when they food that's poverty um, so we we think we, it has to be about the money but we know it's not just about the money I, w I would tend to, 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 to agree with that, but the, and there is that element of um, understanding the way in which the statutory sector then targets its resource um, as a consequence of that, and, and, and that element certainly needs to be captured somewhere. Adam? Um, 
And, uh, other members of the panel want to answer that question before we move on? Or? Well, I think there is um, potentially the use of Gini or some other kind of inequality measure across the, the whole of society, rather than it only being targeting around the levels of po actual poverty f in, ch in childhood, um, is, is a potential addition to this, uh, which would look much more at the distribution of, of income across across the whole, you know, all income groups. Uh, because there is a lot of evidence to suggest that it's the great social gradients that are so you know, contributed towards poor health outcomes, for example. Um, so, and then there's also the question of wealth and debt uh, and, and those questions which can leave people very disabled in terms of their, their, their income because they're, they're, it's not just they don't have an, an adequate income, they, they feel really, really stuck. And again, that can be, uh, have huge consequences in terms of um, people's mental health in particular. Peter Allen. Yeah, do you mind if I just make a supplementary point? That was, uh, was around, if we're measuring income, we tend to talk about the lives of the parents, really, because that's where the income would, would come from. And that's absolutely crucial. So if you want to change income, focus on families and parents. But I think it's, these targets don't really say an awful lot about the experience of the child um, and what the life of the child is like. We, we make a lot of presumptions based on there might not be a lot of money in the house, so therefore the life of the child will be like this. But if we were able to have some kind of progress targets that measured positive improvement in the lives of children who are experiencing poverty, then that would be really positive. Adam. I, I wanted to... Sorry, Robert, did you want to come in? I was just going to say, to, to agree with Peter, that I think we need to be clear what kind of outcomes we, we want for our children, particularly children from low-income families. So we, we presumably want them to, to be safe and healthy and, and to uh, aspire towards uh, their, their potential. Um, so how do we actually get measures and targets in place that, that do all of that? So I think income targets very much have to be part of it, yes. uh, absolutely essential part, but as part of a, a wider dashboard. So let me, give you, let me give you an example of the sorts of things that some of us have been talking about, um, considering adding uh, to the bill, seeing if we can see if seeing if we can add to the bill. And these are issues that we discussed um, with the uh, last uh, panel of witnesses that we had uh, in our first uh, stage one session um, just before the uh, Easter um, recess. Um, and John Dickey, for example, of the Child Poverty Action Group, was enthusiastically in favour of the proposition that I put to him in that session that um, the bill should be extended so that um, there is a requirement to take steps to reduce the attainment gap in education as a measure of child poverty. Um, and given that John Dickey's in favour of that, I wonder what the current panel would, would, would think about seeing a, a measure such as that included uh, in, in this bill. Because we know that there's a relationship between educational underattainment and child poverty. There are relationships between wealth and debt and health uh, and child poverty, as, as uh, uh, Margaret Hanna has just said. But there is also a relationship between educational underperformance, educational attainment gaps, uh, and poverty. And, and, and so the question is whether um, a, a, a specific um, requirement, statutory duty on ministers to take steps to close the attainment gap should be added uh, to a, a bill that is focused on trying to reduce and eventually eliminate um, uh, uh, child poverty in Scotland. It should be added to the bill, but that logic modelling thing I was describing earlier yeah. about where you think what are the, 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 the biggest contributory factors and how could we take early action to change those? And you'd think attainment would be would be one of those. Um, and I think that strong targets associated with those would be more meaningful than waiting five or ten years to see if the income target had changed. Um, it also helps us to, to look at um, how we make policy choices. Um, when John McKendrick um, spoke to our Fairness Commission in Dundee, he said, you know, there may have to be difficult choices to be made in, in tackling poverty. You may not be able to do everything for everyone. Um, and, and attainment was one of the, the ones that we believed was, was the biggest priority. But the way, the way our Fairness Commission recommended uh, change was to say not that we should uh, improve attainment for everyone in the city of Dundee. We should, um, uh, we should close the gap by improving the performance of the, 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 the kids who are getting the, the poorest results. And that, that, takes, that takes quite a different kind of strategic approach. Um, and, and, and it's difficult to argue across the population that we, um, 
we're going to focus help on people who need a bit more rather than we're going to do everything for everyone. I think, I think you've made a very good point. Um, that what I would say is that, of course, it, to address child poverty, th this is for me, it's an indicative um, re um, target to mobilise us to, towards something more ambitious as a country around what is a, an intractable, difficult challenge to address. And the, 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 it, it has many dimensions. Educational attainment will be one, health will be another, um, uh, and, and um, you know, ambition for those children as well will be a third. Uh, the availability of, of, of opportunity for them in their surroundings, you know, just how much can we achieve around reducing food deserts for, from uh, improving the green environment and play spaces for children as well. These elements are all part of, of, of that target, for, to my mind. I've got a broad view of it. So including additional targets actually in the bill, I'm not sure. I think that it's the devil is going to be in the guidance and how we actually report on our progress and think carefully of the impact, for example, on housing, that, that we have um, a very big housing program um, underway in Scotland, which will make a difference in terms of child poverty because it will maintain or, or overall peg housing costs which is a very important part of, of the household income. And after housing costs, one of the reasons why Scotland, compared to the rest of the UK, has, has better um, child poverty levels is because our housing costs are relatively lower. So these are huge contributions to achieving that target. And I, I, I feel that, that that's, that's the, the motivation and the, the spirit of the law, if you like, behind this, this move, rather than it being the specifics. That's very helpful indeed. One more very quick follow-up for me uh, on this before um, other members come in. Uh, in the um, written submission from Fife Partnership, um, uh, it said that uh, you believe that there's a very good opportunity in this bill to use rich data and evidence, much of it held locally, to consider new approaches, reconsider targeting, and how we can do much more on early intervention to prevent child poverty and to break cycles. I, I thought that was a very interesting uh, uh, co contribution. And my question is, what in the bill enables you or us as a country to, to do that? And if the bill doesn't do enough to enable us to do that, what should we add to the bill to ensure that that ambition is realised? Uh, I'm not absolutely sure whether it needs to be written in the face of the bill, but I think it would be very helpful if, if there's reference to, to, to that within the guidance. Um, and quite often the, the, the devil's in the, in the guidance rather than the bill itself. Um, what we were referring to there was that, particularly in, in our administrative data that, that we hold around um, so many different things, we, we understand much more about families and children. Uh, than, and we, we don't, as yet, I don't think, make enough of, of that kind of information mm -hmm. and how we join it all up you know, between the, the various partners. So to give some examples of that, you know, and it's uh, this may be um, leaning too much on the deficit side of things, but we, we 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 know who accesses things like crisis grants. We we know who um, collects who uh, uh, applies for discretionary housing benefits. We know who seeks um, debt crisis support. We know who use who uses food banks. Mm -hmm. So we actually know a great deal about families in our areas. And I think we need to do much more um, to develop that understanding, to develop an understanding of their circumstances and characteristics to enable us to, to target um, the kind of action that's needed to reduce child poverty. And, and if, I, if I could perhaps briefly say, the Health Service has got a long history of using data to reflect on past harm and is moving in various parts across uh, internationally, across Scotland and um, across the UK into the territory of using those data to anticipate future harm. The opportunity through the alignment of health and social care to bring the local authority and other partners into that conversation um, and, and into the discipline around the way which we collectively use data, you could see real opportunities um, against the background of this agenda. And this was one of the recommendations from our Fairer Five Commission was to, look, to, to, to take that opportunity and use it in a much more um, 
coordinated way. There's just a, a wider comment to make also about this, um, reflecting partly on what Peter was saying earlier, that Michael Marmot has written widely around this whole agenda and talks about uh, um, proportionate universalism. And I think that that idea that we have universalism around our public provision, but there's a proportionate um, element of that which is necessary to reduce that gradient across society. Uh, and I think that might be quite a helpful way of, of seeing how we, we address these, these issues together. Thank you very much. Gordon Lindhurst. Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Uh, what I, I wanted to ask about, in this area, Jean Freeman, the minister responsible, has talked about a human rights-based approach, uh, I think, in this area as well. And um, looking at the, the bill as it currently is drafted, the, the committee's had a number of submissions, including from the Law Society of Scotland. And I think what the Law Society said was that laying annual progress reports before Parliament would encourage progress um, scrutiny and oversight, but the concern raised is that, um, to use their words, these measures alone will not secure the success of the bill's aims. Um, it is unclear to us what the consequences, if any, would be if the targets are not met. And they question whether the bill in its current form is justiciable, and therefore that it could prove largely unenforceable, and therefore ineffective. And of course, I think by justiciable, probably, one is looking at the question of an individual's rights to enforce anything before the courts, which is normally what one would understand to be um, human rights in effective form or in respect of an individual's situation. I'm just wondering if members of the panel could comment on that. considered it from a, a specifically from a human rights perspective I think that we we my reading of the the, the bill is that it's it's a, it's a good faith thing that the government will be expecting local authorities and their partners and other other bodies to be acting in good faith to reduce child poverty um, but I hadn't looked into it in, in more detail than that sorry so, so I, I would be I think of a similar view that I, my expectation of the outcome would be something that's perceived to be facilitative and supportive. Um, there is always an anxiety in anything that you, you put in statute that you get into the territory of sanction. Um, and um, I think experience in, in, in other areas around that sanction-based model is that we don't get into sustainable solutions. We quite often get into models of temporary improvement that seek to offset the potential of a sanction, but we don't get into the, the territory of sustainability. And for me, the um, opportunity that this bill presents is one to take us into sustainable solutions. Yeah, simply to agree with that, I think, is a, is a position. I, I think there's, there's, there's almost two issues there you, you might want to separate. One would be the, the human rights and whether it was justiciable. Or, and, and then the level of scrutiny and who would scrutinise the, 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 the reports. Um, and I think that's absolutely crucial. I think that um, in previous sessions you've been asking about the role of the ministerial uh, the advisory group. And that might be a role for, for a body like that. Because who, who's going to look at all the reports that are produced, the, the delivery plan for the government or the local plan, and say, this is doing enough, this is going far enough and fast enough to seriously reduce inequality? I'd be interested to know who on, on what you're going to base that on, and um, what might be helpful is, is the notion of a, as a, of a, a broader outcome framework around uh, child poverty. So I know you're looking at a, a, thinking about a, a range of measures in, 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 as well as the income target, and a good starting point might be um, we, we in, in Dundee we based uh, some work on NHS Health Scotland's mental health outcome framework and adapted that to look at uh, issues around fairness and poverty. And that, that started to draw a, a broader picture of the, the causes and consequences of, of poverty. And, the, and we may be able to use that as a basis for better scrutiny. I think the, the Law Society's concern was probably about lack of accountability. And of course, uh, scrutiny can be through the courts, particularly when it comes to human rights issues. Now, as you say, a bill may or may not have 
particular purpose, which, uh, from what you're saying, you don't necessarily view the lack of any individual rights-based approach in the bill to be necessarily a difficulty, if I'm understanding correctly. But scrutiny, of course, can also be through other means, not just through the courts. So, for example, Inclusion Scotland and I think the, the Poverty Alliance have called for the bill to include additional reporting provisions. And this would entail that reports are not just laid before the Scottish Parliament, but require parliamentary approval. And second, that laid reports before the Parliament should be scrutinised by the Scottish Parliament prior to, I think, official publication, it would be. Um, if the panel don't think it's necessary to have um, provisions that provide the opportunity for scrutiny through the courts in relation to human rights, which would be the normal manner in which human rights are enforced, um, do the panel think that these other propositions, which I think are more parliamentary scrutiny based intended, would, would that be a good idea or would that make up for the lack of the other possibility of scrutiny? Go, the, goes to the heart of the, the, the purpose of this legislation, whether or not it is actually to, um, to, to take that rights-based approach around individuals and their, and their circumstances, um, and therefore you know, to, to take the matter through courts and get that um, uh, addressed through that process. Or is it about our collective ambition as a nation to articulate an aspiration which we as a, as a, well, not we, the government is, is prepared to um, accept responsibility for. Um, I see a parallel with um, the Climate Change uh, Act and the way in which, you know, in many ways addressing child poverty is as complex as addressing climate change and that these things are, are there to support a process and, and an endeavour across society to address something otherwise if we didn't have that legislation in place we would probably put down the, the list of priorities so I, I'm not convinced of, uh, that, that we are talking here about an individual human rights approach for this legislation I don't think that's its purpose well, um, that, that sorry was the the first aspect the first question but the second question is about the other possibility of scrutiny that is having parliamentary scrutiny. So is that something which you, you think would be appropriate, given, as you say, we're talking possibly about more societal responsibility and how we approach that? We do need to have um, a, a reckoning against which we, we can judge our, perform, our, our progress. And that reckoning, I think, needs to happen at the level of the government. So through Parliament scrutinising the government's collective effort in this regard would be probably the best way forward. Okay. Ben McPherson. And could, I, could I just add something to that? Sure. My understanding from a reading of the bill is, is that at present local authorities and, and health boards would be required to report actions retrospectively. So that I think is quite interesting in terms of seeking approval or otherwise because all we're doing is, is really saying what we've done in the past year. So it, it, that doesn't tally well with, with an approval approach. I can understand in terms of delivery plans and the responsibility that will sit with ministers that it's a different proposition. But at present, the, it, it wouldn't be helpful in a local authority and, and health board uh, responsibility side of things. Ben McPherson. We spoke earlier about the attainment gap and I thought it was interesting that Bernardo has recently stated that it is natural that so much of the debate around the attainment gap focuses on what happens inside our classrooms. However, what happens before and beyond the school gates can be even more important in ensuring that every child has the chance to learn. And for that reason, I would like to bring it back particularly to income, though I appreciate the holistic nature of this issue that Dr. Margaret Hanna just, just spoke of. In th that context, I was really interested in the answer to question two from Robert McGregor. And uh, I thought what, what you said in the last paragraph about it being important to recognise that many of the factors and levers on this issue are at UK or, or international level. 
and the uh, income target set for Scotland have to be caveated as, as such. And I'd be interested to, to, to hear your thoughts if you wanted to expand on that at all. But also, I thought it was very interesting that you said it should be explicit that it's not only public agencies that have leverage on income and others should be drawn into the wider partnership discussion around this. Uh, initiatives such as the Living Wage Campaign, drawing in business are key to this too. And I think that's a, a very pertinent point about how income is distributed uh, widely within the economy. And I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts on, on that issue. Um, on, on that last point there, on, on business and living wage, etc., it's it really just is to emphasise that this really needs to be a partnership response rather than just a health board or uh, a council response. And in Fife, uh, we are keen not just to um, work with the, the usual partners, but to expand the, the set of partners that we we have at community planning level. So it's one of the challenges again that came from our commission on fairness, which is which is around you do partnership work well, but there's there's plenty of scope there for expanding and, and doing more and bringing in other players who hold some of those levers um, as, as as part of uh, a, a new strategic partnership to tackle inequalities and poverty. And and in that mode of thinking, is the will the bill create useful leadership, initiative, direction, focus, the things that Dr Margaret Hanna picked up on at the beginning in order to help create those wider relationships and help build those uh, networks in order to tackle this in a holistic way across our economy and our society? I think it depends on the, on the way it's finally written. So if, if it doesn't actually make specific references to the contributions of that wider partnership, then I, th I think it's limited in, in, its, in, in, in doing that. So I, th I think for it to be more explicit about those those additional responsibilities and who, and who can play a part would be helpful. Thank you. Alison Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask the panel if you think that the bill could do more around... Well, the bill proposes targets and measures, but perhaps um, doesn't go into detail about how those targets can best be achieved. Do you think it would be helped by a bit more direction on that front? My earlier comment about the, the, uh, a logic model or a, an, an outcomes framework, I think, would be really helpful around that. So if we can agree what the ma major causes of child poverty are and what uh, effective action could be taken to address them and having targets associated with those, so it's a, it's a short-term and intermediate and a long-term range of outcomes and measures, I think that would, that would help. I think from a health perspective, we have, um, are always thoughtful around the way in which we use measures of improvement and, and bring that philosophy of improvement um, in, into what we do. And there's something about a very focused target and guidance that supports the um, delivery of improvement, me uh, improvement measures against the background and of, ev of an evidence base of what we know we can achieve. So I, I think the way in which we look to produce the guidance to support the bill may deal with some of the areas that you highlight. I think there's, uh, there's a good and improving understanding of what programmes and projects and interventions work in, in Scotland. And I think we need to do much more to, to share learning on that and to ensure that um, th those that are, are less active on this agenda are able to pick up uh, very positively on, on what works. Um, so I, I, I think that should be part of the initial focus. Thank you. Uh, just to echo what Robert is saying, um, I have found it very interesting to read the background comments from even just Dundee to see what they've been doing in response to their fair, fairer Dundee commission. That you know, there's a lot of commonalities across the two areas. I know we're just across a river, but you don't necessarily get that chance to know much about the detail about what your even your even your neighbouring local authority is doing. And I think if we could find better ways of of learning together around what works for us, it would be really a way of accelerating the pace in addressing this challenge for ourselves. Um, 
can I ask how confident um, the panel are that the data we have is, is robust and accurate enough? Um, you know, are we confident that we're measuring child poverty accurately? Who would like to respond? Shall I maybe start with me? So I think from a public health perspective, and Dr Hannah's better place the, 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 than I am to offer a view around that, I think we are measuring the, the, the right things. In terms of our ability to understand the impact of some of the interventions that we collectively can offer, I'm not sure we're as sophisticated as we could and should be around that. And, and again, the, from a the perspective, from a Tayside perspective, we've embraced the Integrated Children's Service Plan with our, from our local authority partners, police and, 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 and voluntary sector um, in a way that would help us define a different suite of measures against the background of our children's service provision, a subset of which would be, uh, would be a focus on, on poverty. So um, I don't think we're there yet. But again, I think the, the focus that the Act will bring will give a a people an opportunity to describe it, the problem in a slightly different way. Yeah, I, I, um, I think that the more information that's available at a local authority or an individual data zone better uh, level, the better. Um, especially if you want us to be able to, to chart progress within local areas. Um, I think that there's there's a real need to improve the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation because as terrific as it is, and I think it's really, really helpful, I think some of the, the, the factors within it are, are tend to lag, the, the information tends to lag quite a bit behind. And I think we use the SIMD so much that the, the better it could be, the, the more influential it would be. But my last, last point would be, I, I firmly believe that it's not the, the data that's stopping us doing something about child poverty now. I think everybody knows what the issue is, everybody knows what the factors are, everybody knows we should be doing something about it. And I think it would be tragic if we're waiting for a better statistic to come along to tell us what we should be, what we should be doing. Um, I don't think it's a, it's a lack of, of data, although it would help us to, to measure progress. I think these are pretty good. Um, they, they, they've gone through quite a, uh, an in-depth methodology. Um, I think we, we're just using what was previously done with the UK government's um, methodology. So I, th I think that issue is not really... Um, well, I, could, I can assure the committee about, about around that. You're also dealing with very big numbers, so the likelihood of variation is, is real rather than apparent. Um, actually, I've, I've quite welcomed the, the address, addressing this in addition to SIMD because I think we've got kind of habituated almost to SIMD and, and, and our thinking is only kind of looking at that, that cluster and, and area-based approach, whereas this is actually a slightly different way of representing our challenge. And, um, and I think it's giving us a bit more of, a, of, a, of an ambition to make a difference in, in those families' lives. I think the, the point Robert was making earlier about how we could use our local data to make an impact on that um, is, is, is also important. So it's not just about the, the target as, as set, but what we will be doing locally using an in intelligence-led approach to address the challenge. No, I'm sorry, I don't have time. George Adam. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Uh, I was just quite interested. Luckily, my question follows on from Alison Johnson's. That worked out for us. Uh, but yeah. effectively, what I was wanting to ask was, that as a former councillor, I've heard all this talk, you know, about we can share more information, we can do things. Because I don't doubt for a minute that there's great work happening in 32 authorities on child poverty throughout Scotland. But the problem we've always had has been actually sharing the information and getting out there. Does this bill give us that opportunity to maybe focus and actually, as you were talking there earlier on, uh, Dr Margaret Hanna, about the fact that you're across the water but you're actually listening to each other because you're here today, you know, does this give us an opportunity to create that dialogue and actually focus on that so that we can really, you know, does, does that targeting help with that? Much so. I think having an annual re reporting on this agenda, it will keep it alive. We will have events. We will have we we'll have a lot of learning. I, I anticipate that that's that's the way we would want to go forwards. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment. I, I would absolutely agree with, with the statement that you, you just made, Demonstrator. I think the 
the, the, it's the, the focus, um, and I think it's the developing common understandings of what good looks like is an important part of this. One of the things that keeps coming up uh, with some of the things I think Peter Allen said about the good faith of local authorities working w with everyone else as well, and Robert McGregor said, uh, join up, uh, join the thinking up together. And I, I think I feel that you know we, we do get bogged down in SIMD figures, uh, uh, but uh, this gives us another opportunity to look at a broader uh, scope. And uh, is that not the point of this bill? is the fact that that's exactly what we're trying to do, is we're trying to all sit here and say, can we actually do something? We already do the work, but can we find a way to get that together and ensure that we can put it through? You know, is that not the main point of this bill? It's a simple question, but... <laughs> right. I, I would agree with that. I, th I, th I think that in terms of partners and sharing information and working collaboratively, one of the, the challenges for us uh, is is how we bring, for example, the Department for Work and Pensions uh, to the table on this one. Um, because yeah, no, no. <laughs> but they, they obviously hold rich data as well. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we've begun to establish very good positive relationships with DWP at the most local of levels. Um, but we still have difficulty accessing um, timelessly um, some some good strong information from them that would help us with our planning. Just and it's very short, uh, convener, is the fact that we had uh, three academics uh, in the Glasgow meeting, and in that lovely, God bless them, academic way, they fell out each other very politely. But it was on the fact that they don't have the data, you know. And being academics, they wanted to know exactly where everything is, and they couldn't say anything. So. All we're agreeing here is the fact that this will br bring that a step closer for them to be able to go back and do some work and actually study that in future points as well. Okay, thank you. Just finally, um, I have to confess that what I struggle with sometimes um, looking at this bill is that um, not to underplay the need for data and you need data to work on and so on, but it's trying to boil that down into, well, what then would you expect any government to do? Um, and uh, Peter, I think you said something about, can we agree what the major causes are? Um, well, I'm not sure that there is agreement around that. I think may perhaps there needs to be more work done so that we have a broad consensus because if we're going to spend the next 20 years just, um, I think you said this already, just looking at the data and recording uh, poverty, then perhaps we're not going to give ourselves um, the boost that's needed. Um, if you could very briefly just give me one or two measures that you think would make the biggest difference. If, if there was a duty on the government in the bill to take specific measures as part of their requirements, what would they be? I'm not going to be terribly helpful, but I, I think that the, quite, the, the thing that we need to focus most on is, is, is stigma and how we change perceptions and how people are treated. I don't know how you, how you turn that into an indicator, but that's an enormous issue in the lives of people who are poor. So. Thank you. So, so I, I would agree. I think that the, the poverty of opportunity that's associated with that is, is critical to providing people different life chances. I, I think what Mr. Tompkins said was was uh, was interesting and very relevant here around educational attainment, and I think that uh, a continued push on that would would take us some way towards addressing child poverty in the longer term. Um, and, and you know, looking at the graph in the pen, Annex A and, and the way in which it's, it's levelled off and there's a potentially, is it getting worse again, our relative poverty? I mean, we know that there's been a lot of changes in welfare and uh, tax credit reforms, etc. I mean, the extent to which those can be reversed is a, is a political decision. Um, the um, living wage, which we, we want to make um, uh, Fife a living wage region, um, Scotland a living wage country, which I think is, is aspiring to, but these are things that certainly could, could be suggested. Um, and then child benefit, um, it seems a fairly obvious measure, but if you could add to the child benefit level, um, that would already, and it's been stated in one of the um, 
uh, responses to your consultation that it would lift uh, five pounds a week would lift thirty children thirty thousand children out of poverty um, a, a year. So, so there are some simple things that could be done uh, around um, fiscal measures, uh, benefit measures. Um, but I think the other thing is not just around that poverty of aspiration about. Uh, a life worth living in the 21st century. What are our children going to be living in? Uh, and can we create the, the, the environment whereby children and young people do um, are encouraged to aspire to something better in their lives, regardless of their background? Uh, and I think we've got a good long tradition of that in Scotland. Uh, many of us have come from working class backgrounds ourselves, but through education and encouragement, we are where we are today. Uh, and I think that that message could still be there for our young people in the future. Thank you very much. That's an excellent note to end on. Just to thank you for your for your evidence and also just to acknowledge as um, you asked us to in the submission about the wonderful work that's done by uh, local authorities in relation to not just poverty but I uh, note that you use the word fairness which I think is quite important too so thank you very much for your contribution Thank you I'm suspending the meeting very briefly so that we can just uh, allow the panel to leave and the new panel to join us And I'd like to warmly welcome Bill Scott, Director of Policy, Inclusion Scotland, who's been with us many times before, and Emma Trottier, Policy Manager of Engender, who we've also had in front of the committee before. Um, so thank you very much for appearing before the committee. And as usual, we're under the usual time pressure. We must finish by 11, but that does give us 40 minutes or so. And I'd like to first of all call Ruth Maguire. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, my question's actually for um, Emma this morning, first of all, um, and specifically around women and poverty. And I just wonder if you could um, share with the committee, um, you mentioned a, a gendered approach um, on the face of the bill being helpful. Just what is a gendered um, approach? Um, I think what was important when we were looking at this bill at the office was to make sure that what was being considered had a gender dimension of poverty. So what that means is that we don't think that you can separate um, children's well-being from that of their mothers. Uh, so we know that in Scotland right now, you know, one in four children are living in poverty. We know that with cuts to social security, um, and the wider austerity agenda are going to have significant ramifications on families and children, but especially women. Um, you know, 86% of the cuts to Social Security are coming from women's incomes, and that's a significant sum. And we also know that um, over the next decade, there'll be the biggest rise in inequality uh, in the United Kingdom. And what we wanted to make sure of is that when we talk about children, that we're remembering. Um, the people that care for them, um, the women that are in that household uh, as their mothers, and how difficult uh, their futures are looking right now. In Scotland, nine out of ten lone parents are women, uh, and 95% of those lone um, mothers live and um, support their children uh, through social security programs. So I think when we talk about the gendered approach to the bill, it's really just saying we have to remember the gender dimension of poverty. 
Thank you, that was helpful. Can I just ask a follow-up on that? <coughs> yeah. A very question, Camina. I mean, just in terms of practical consideration of the bill in front of us, what kind of amendments to the bill would you like to see in order um, for you to be confident that the gendered approach to poverty has been recognised in this bill, or does this bill do it already? Uh, I think one of the comments that we made in our submission was that much of the changes are going to hinge on what's in the delivery plans. So when we talk about what actions are going to be taken, we have to make sure that those actions uh, consider gender. So for example, um, we know that, and research has been done and evidence shows that if we want to talk about significant change, um, alleviating poverty and helping um, women uh, involves looking at child care reforms, significant and meaningful child care reforms. So when we talk about delivery plans, are the policy areas that are going to be considered looking at child care? Are they going to be looking at education and gender stereotyping that happens with boys and girls? Um, will it be looking at employment strategies that are gendered, so closing that gender pay gap that exists here? Um, and, and do you think that on the face of the bill there should be a statutory requirement that the delivery plans do that? Do the, that, that they consider gender, that they consider all of those policy areas? Uh, either of the above. The, you know, the, the options are open. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gen genuinely interested in, um, uh, in the extent to which you think this bill already satisfies the you know, very stringent and you know, uh, perfectly reasonable criteria that you've set for it. Um, and if it doesn't meet those um, uh, requirements, uh, what, you know, what amendments would you like to see this committee um, urge upon the government in order to improve the bill? If you want to take back to the office. In, yeah. I, I, I think it should in, um, include a requirement to address known societal inequalities of wealth between, you know, between various equality groups, specifically women. Disabled women are much more likely to be living in poverty than disabled men. Um, and that's, again, due to caring responsibilities. It's a cause of uh, family breakup. So, again, there are many more disabled women who are lone parents. Um, so, a gendered approach would assist dis disabled women. But an approach that addressed societal inequalities of race, gender, age, and disability would be one where I think um, we would see everybody being pulled up, rather than, as, as we said in our submission, one of the, the problems is that you can Im improve things generally, but leave certain groups behind. And in fact, the inequalities for those groups actually grow, um, because everybody, everybody else is doing better. So um, that we would like to see something on the face of the bill about addressing inequalities. Um, you know, the ones that are mainly identified through inequalities legislation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry to Just be before we close on that, I mean, it, it, it makes sense, uh, and we've heard from your organisations many times, and I think that, that these are the kind of underlying uh, issues that um, the government needs to address in, in addressing poverty. But as I said to the previous panel, what I sometimes struggle with, what I would worry about is that we'll all be happy if that's, if we can get that on the face of the bill, then it's a really good statement of where we want to go. But I, I, I would think it's worth giving consideration to what specific measures that would then make a difference to tackling. So, so lone parents, as you said, nine out of ten are women. But so, so, so those, are the, those are the facts. But does that not imply that there needs to be some addressing of lone parents and the needs of lone parents specifically to take them out of poverty? I think it goes back to looking at it perhaps more broadly. Um, so again, going back to social security reforms and ensuring you know that we're maximizing people's incomes because we know that lone parents um, are 95 percent are living on on the assistance of social security. Uh, looking at childcare and how we support them um, through flexible, high quality, affordable childcare. Um, employment strategies. How do we support, you know, through childcare, but other measures, getting lone parents into employment where, where we can. 
so I'm not sure that if it's it's looking at lone parents exclusively or it's looking at sort of bigger policy areas and then how we fit everybody into those um, policy areas. Uh, just just on because you, since you mentioned it, um, income maximisation is an important so so. My question on that is: Would it not maybe make sense then to place a duty on income maximisation in this bill? rather than the Social Security Bill. Well, you can come back to us on that, but what I'm really interested in is how do we turn the targets into what may be specific measures, but it would be... I think that should be in the delivery plan. You in know, the delivery plan, OK. The delivery plan should say how you're going to achieve it. And the problem with putting it on the face of the bill would be that it, it concentrates minds on those things that are in the bill. Um, that become the legislation, that then becomes everything that local authorities, the NHS, Scottish Government, etc., will address. And the problem is, if it's not in the face of the bill, th those other groups who aren't mentioned may find that there's no activity um, uh, locally or nationally uh, to address the poverty that they experience. So you've got you've got the problem. Of how do we make sure everybody that you know? And I think the delivery plan would be a better way of, 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 of uh, approach, as long as there is proper parliamentary scrutiny of the delivery plan and of its implementation. Yeah. Alison Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, I know that um, in gender, previously, it, it, there was a publication of yours that, that I read that suggested that since 2010, of £26 billion worth of welfare cuts, £22 billion had impacted on women. And I just find it it's staggeringly discriminatory. <laughs> and, I, you know, I don't know what sort of gender impact assessment has been carried out, but it, it would seem none. You know, it clearly doesn't matter. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies have said that the projected increase in absolute child poverty is entirely explained by tax and benefit changes, um, like the ones we've already seen. So I'd just like to ask you a couple of questions. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has called for the use of an after essential cost focus rather, rather than just um, after housing costs. Now, last night in here, I sponsored an event which was... It was about learning from abroad, and one of the issues we were looking at was childcare. And um, two academics were reporting back on a study, £190 for full-time childcare in Norway compared to £920 for full-time childcare in Scotland. And um, one contributor spoke of childcare costs of over £1,400 a month for two children. Now, if we're not including costs that are higher than you know, your average mortgage or rent, we're missing. We, we really are missing something while we're looking at, at, at these costs. So um, could you just touch on that, the need to include more than just after housing costs? And also, should there be some provision in the bill requiring ministers to conduct annual checks to, to see how effectively the social security system is contributing to reaching our child poverty targets? Could, could I come in, Please. Alison? I mean, you know, we, we're very aware of the impact on, on women. Um, as I said, you know, disabled women, especially those who are carers, uh, have been doubly impacted because a lot of the cuts are also falling on disabled people. Um, so, for example, 100,000 disabled children have, have seen the... Uh, amount that families awarded in dis disabled child tax credits cut by 50% from £54 a week to £27 a week with the introduction of universal credit. Now, that doesn't just impact, obviously, on that child or on that mother. It impacts on everyone in the family when there are less resources available in that family. And that's why disabled children and the, the children of disabled parents are more likely to be living in poverty in many ways and you know the, the issue here is that some poverty um, seems to be invisible and, 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 and not addressed and again to give you an example the fact is that the higher rate of uh, the disabled uh, child edition has been raised in the current budget but the lower rate and that's the ones that have already experienced that cut has been frozen. 
and there's been no publicity about that whatsoever. It wasn't announced in advance of the budget. There's been no con consultation with disabled people's organisations, and yet the impact on those families with disabled children is going to be quite profound because their benefit is not going to rise uh, in line with living costs. Um, it's, it's going to be frozen. Um, so, yeah, I, th I, think, I think including Social Security, it isn't all Scottish Parliament's. Scottish Government's responsibility, but part of it is, and the parts that we have responsibility for should certainly be a focus within that on addressing poverty. And, um, you know, what else are the benefits for? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And if I could just jump in on the first question of um, after housing costs, I think what you're getting at with some of the submissions mentioning the um, fact that we should be looking at maybe essential costs that families have, um, and I would agree, uh, just given the um, the cost of childcare in Scotland and how difficult that is for families um, to afford to put their children in childcare and the downstream impacts that that has on women. Um, I think also, though, when I was reading through the submissions, I was looking at how we look at targets and how we look at household uh, income for targets, and one thing um, that we should consider when we're thinking about women uh, is just that access to resources is a, fun a fundamental element of gender inequality. Um, so when we're looking at household incomes, you're really just looking at the income of that house, and you're missing um, the dynamics that are happening inside the home. Um, so access to resources isn't equal. There's power imbalances throughout Scotland, um, throughout households in Scotland. So how do we account for, for those? Yeah. I think is a, and it's a tough question, but um, yeah. it's one that I think we need to be and, asking. And, and, and unfortunately, the introduction of universal credit, because it rolls up so many benefits into one, increases um, the likelihood that only one person in the household is in control of that income. And that is usually the male claimant, yes. <laughs> rather than uh, the, the person, the woman, with caring responsibilities in, in that house, which is why we've been very supportive of splitting the payment within households to ensure that at least some of the money reaches the person that is most likely to use it for care of the child. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just as you said there, that um, Emma, that the power balances within households, and I think that's a really important point. That obviously the bill focuses on income, but having a look at what that actually means uh, within our health, I think it's quite an important point. But how do you think the bill could address that point? So before I came here, I was looking at other, uh, well, not other, just studies that have been done in the UK that have looked at. Um, poverty uh, and women. And there was a UK that, uh, study done by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and Oxford University. And what they came out saying was that it was really hard to look and understand women's poverty because of the way that we have, the way that we collect data, which is done by households. So one of their um, recommendations was to really think about how governments are collecting data. Um, if we want to start making some big changes within household incomes, uh, we have to think about the women and the men that are in um, those houses. So what they had suggested was, was that government should capture and interrogate data that's disaggregated by gender, that's disaggregated by race, um, at the level of individuals, and that would complement um, the household incomes that are being examined as, as targets for poverty reduction. Thank you. Anyone else? Ben McPherson. In your written submissions, you both comment on interim targets, and I just wondered if you wanted to uh, detail your thoughts on them here today and, and why you think they're important. We think they're important because they concentrate minds. Um, if, a, if a goal is way off in the future, and um, it may be two or three governments from now that are actually held to account for the attainment of that goal, uh, then unfortunately, in the meantime, not a lot might happen. Um, whereas if you have delivery plans, which you report on regularly, and interim targets that you set yourself to measure whether you're making progress towards your ultimate goal, then you are much more likely to concentrate the minds of planners, officials, uh, government itself, uh, politicians at a local and national level on 
what are we doing? How are we going about it? Are we making the progress that, that's being demanded of us? Um, so I, we think then interim targets are, are a good idea because, because they, they set milestones that you can measure progress uh, towards. Um, yes, thank, thank you, convener. A <clears throat> um, question really for Bill Scott, and I think, in fact, both of our panel members possibly heard my question to the last panel. Uh, but um, in particular, so I'll not, I'll not repeat it, but it's basically about the question of accountability. And um, I take on board the point that you've made that um, if you start listing specific groups in, a, in an act of parliament or a bill, then there's other groups that might not be covered. So your point is better to cover detail of that nature in the delivery plan or the guidance or policy notes, whatever form that takes. Um, but the question still arises, how does one then uh, hold the government to account in terms of the targets in the bill? And I think, as I indicated to the last panel, the, the comment was, uh, I think both from your organ own organisation and one other at least, that uh, there should be reports not just laid before the Scottish Parliament, but should require parliamentary approval and also uh, such reports should require to be scrutinised by the Parliament, thus bringing in, <clears throat> as I understand it from one of the previous panel members, the, the national element of scrutiny of what is actually being done. Um, would you be able to sort of um, amplify that and indicate again how the bill could be uh, amended, altered to take that on board? I think it could be amended quite easily to, to require um, approval of uh, the delivery plans of um, your reports uh, on progress, etc., especially on reports about interim targets, for example. Um, and with that, you at least, again, have uh, scrutiny at a parliamentary level, but also because the media covers what parliament does, you're more likely to uh, get scrutiny at a public level as well um, of of what's happening and, and people being held to account uh, um, by the electorate um, for whether targets have been achieved or not. Um, I think without that, um, it, it lacks teeth a little. Um, I was very interested in what the Law, Law Society were talking about, about um, individual rights. We think those rights exist at the moment um, uh, under current legislation. Um, right to an adequate income, uh, etc., is guaranteed, um, supposedly, by human rights uh, and should be justiciable. Um, we're not sure. I, I, I think we would probably be the same mind as, as the last panel, um, that, that this is really setting a, tar setting a target for society, Scottish society, to achieve over the longer term and, and the individual rights under it. It wasn't something we were thinking of, although human rights are always part of our approach. Um, but uh, it's an interesting thought. <laughs> uh, you would have individual rights, poss possibly. Just, just wonder if I could just follow that up, um, perhaps, because of course, uh, the scrutiny, you can have scrutiny at different levels, you can have scrutiny through the courts. Uh, and I think probably you'll be aware, as I am as a lawyer, that if you don't have something in an act of parliament, then it's more difficult potentially to enforce before the courts or for individuals to um, make anything out of it, if I can put it in very colloquial terms. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, on that basis, if you think simply having the, the scrutiny before the parliament itself will be sufficient, if that is added in. I'm not sure it's this bill that it would be um, what we would rate that, that, that on. Um, uh, if the Scottish Government does um, adopt the social and economic duties that it's uh, said it will do under international law, then they may provide the correct vehicle for um, individuals to assert their rights to an adequate income, etc. Um, because if, if they are going to adopt that, I would imagine that they were, they're going to do, through, do so through legislation. Maybe some of them members of the governing party can tell me. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, I, ju I just wondered if Emma had any further comment on that, because you may do. No, I think we support uh, and gender supports what Inclusion Scotland has submitted in their response. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you. 
Back to Ben McPherson. Thanks, Thanks <laughs> Convener. Just, just a very quick point for Emma Trotter and, 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 and gender. You made reference to, to childcare uh, throughout some of your, your previous answers. And I just wondered if you could comment on the provision of free childcare and being advantageous for reducing child poverty. And obviously there's a, a commitment from the, the Scottish Government to significantly increase free childcare and also a consultation is taking place around flexibility and provision of that. Um, and I wondered if you could comment on uh, your thoughts on what impact they, that may have on child poverty. Uh, I think it would have a significant impact on child poverty. Um, we know that pathways into poverty for men and women are different, and one of the um, and the risks for that, you know, change over a woman's life. Uh, but there are certain moments um, that women face where they have increased risk of falling into poverty, and one of those is motherhood. Um, and I would point the committee to some interesting testimony that have been going on at the. I think it's the economy, jobs, and fair work right now that's looking at the gender pay gap. Um, and Anna Ritchie Allen, Emma Rich appeared um, from Close the Gap and in Gender and spoke about um, what that risk looks like for women. Um, but when we talk about childcare and investment in childcare, I think that will play a huge role in both um, helping women and alleviating poverty. Um, I think there's a bigger conversation to be had about what we mean when we say um, flexible, affordable, and high quality childcare. Um, but I think that might be uh, a different committee meeting. Um, but that yes, those are really crucial elements uh, that, that we need to talk about and that need to be considered uh, in delivery plans. Thank you. It's a holistic issue, so it's good to get that. Okay. And last question, Adam Tonkins. Yeah, thank you very much. And just, I mean, building directly on uh, what um, Ben McPherson was just talking about uh, in the context of um, uh, what you just said there, Emma, about, about delivery plans. And, and Bill, you, you've, you've talked about this too. And it seems to me, you know, the more I look at this bill, the more critical um, to its success um, are going to be these these delivery plans. Um, uh, and at the, at the moment, again, looking at the bill, you know, all the bill says about the delivery plans is that they should be produced um, at five yearly intervals, um, and there is no statutory requirement anywhere, so far as I can see in the bill, unless I've misread it, um, as to what should be or what must be in those delivery plans. So two questions. One about the frequency of the bill. Sorry, the frequency of the plans. <laughs> um, and uh, second, about um, uh, the, the, the sorts of things that you would like to see added to the bill that, um, that, 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 that impose requirements, impose obligations uh, on the people writing these delivery plans as to what they, what they have to include. Um, it's been suggested by a number of, um, uh, of, of our witnesses in terms of the oral evidence that we've received, including children in Scotland and Citizens Advice Scotland, that um, delivery plans should be produced at three yearly intervals rather than five yearly intervals as proposed on the bill. So I'd, I'd like to ask you first whether you think that that's right. And second, do I take it from the evidence that we've had uh, from you this morning, which I think has been very powerful and very effective, if I may say so, that you would like that you would like to see a statutory requirement, for example, um, that the delivery plan must include um, detail as to the steps which are taken to reduce childcare costs, uh, for example? Um, we, I, I think I would, we would agree with the, the um, three years rather than, than five. Um, because that would make it within the lifetime of a government, usually. Um, and uh, so that, that would be one step forward. We also would like to see statutory duties placed on local authorities uh, and other uh, community planning organisations about the eradication of child poverty at a local level, um, and, and specifically to include child poverty within local outcome improvement plans and children's services plans. You know what they're not just reporting on what they're doing, but actually developing plans to to address the issue. And I think the most important thing that we would argue in terms of the delivery plans is speak to the people that are living in poverty. They know what that what it is, and they know often how to get out of it if you would only listen to them. And and therefore, there's a need to speak to lone parents, disabled people, parents of disabled children. You know, black and minority ethnic groups, etc., because they're all more likely to be living in poverty, and they know the stigma 
that, uh, and discrimination that they face, and they know some of the things that need to be done to address that. So, in, in bringing together the law of very planned, whether at a national level or, or a local level, those groups have to should there should be a requirement to speak to those groups, and that you know their ideas are incorporated in, into the plan wherever possible. You know, um, because otherwise, um, you'll have high level stuff going on that doesn't con connect to the people uh, that are most likely to face it. And, and, and on the attainment issue, uh, I don't think necessarily it should be on the face of the bill, but I do agree very strongly with you, Adam, that, that it is a huge issue. Uh, disabled children are twice as likely to leave school with no qualifications as non-disabled children, and that's regardless of the type of impairment they have. So there are disabled children with sensory impairments, physical impairments, no intellectual impairment, whatsoever, leaving school with no qualifications. That makes their chances in the current job market nil. <laughs> you know, and unless we change that, we won't change their futures. And when they become parents, they'll, beca they'll be parents living in poverty and their children will be living in poverty. So we have to change that cycle. Um, and therefore, you know, addressing the attainment gap is certainly possible to address it without addressing the needs of disabled children. But it makes it much, much more difficult. So, you know, again, concentrate in minds. If we're, if we're going to have an attainment challenge, it has to take into account the needs of those that have been most left behind. I have to say, I took part in a workshop with EIS representatives uh, no more than a month ago. And I was in one workshop, but there were six workshops going on. Five of them came back and said that the key issue that was facing them as teachers and as union reps was the lack of additional support for learning support um, in the classroom and the cuts that had been made to the support that disabled children receive in the classroom because the classrooms were becoming more disruptive, it was harder to deal with the non-disabled children, etc., if they devoted the time to, to make sure that disabled children were being kept up to speed, etc. So, you know, cuts have consequences. <laughs> And uh, you know, we we definitely see the attainment gap as one of the key issues that we would need to be addressed over the longer term. Well, thank you very much. A good note to end on. Um, just to thank you both, Inclusion Scotland and Engender, for um, your ongoing support for the committee and your evidence today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the committee are now going to go into private session.